Hello and welcome to the France 24 interview. I'm Annette Young. Well, the list of people applying to be the next UN Secretary General keeps growing. And this time around, a record number of women are putting their hands up. And now adding her name to the list is Christiana Figueres, the senior UN official who helped get the Paris Climate Change Accord signed off last year. And she joins me in the studio today. Christiana, thank you so much for thank being you, here. Thank you, Annette, for a very nice, uh, very nice invitation. Thanks very very much. Christiana, what made you decide to throw your hat into the ring? Um, well, let's see, a couple of things actually, a couple of factors. Uh, I think uh, in the lead up to Paris and certainly after the Paris uh, Agreement, there were many people who were saying, hmm, should you take these skills of listening to everybody and bringing people to agreement and to understanding with each other, should you take them to the next level? Um, so, you know, that's, that's one part of it. But fundamentally, Annette, fundamentally, it's because I do believe that we're in a very, very critical period of, uh, of history in the world uh, in which there really is a battle between dislocation uh, and conversation, a real battle between confrontation and collaboration. Uh, and I am very much on the second part of that. I am very much of a person who believes that collaboration, cooperation, dialogue, understanding each other is more powerful than confrontation. And I think that that's necessary to raise that voice and raise that flag uh, to strengthen multilateralism even more than where we have it, and frankly, to bring a little hope back to the world. But why so late in the day? Well, because this was my personal choice, not, you know, not a judgment on anyone else. It's just a personal jo uh, choice that uh, I did not finish my responsibilities with the Climate Convention Secretariat until the 6th of July at midnight. Um, and I had uh, already several months ago after Costa Rica and I decided that we would launch the candidacy, I decided I would not uh, do it before finishing my responsibility because I believe finish one thing well before starting something else. So uh, I finished my responsibility on the 6th of July at midnight and on the 7th of July at 8 a.m. Already in Costa Rica, uh, we launched the candidacy, losing no, no time. No rest for the wicked there. No, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> now, 11 people have put their hand up so far, and among them, obviously, as I just said earlier, a record number of women, including Helen Clark, the former New Zealand Prime Minister, and Irina Bukova, the head of UNESCO. Do you think this time around gender should be a factor in deciding who gets the job? Well, you know, I think one thing that is exciting about uh, having launched so so late is that uh, my candidacy was the candidacy that brought gender parity. So now we have six women and six men. So that's uh, that's already exciting. Uh, we have six women from the Eastern European region, and we have six women outside of the Eastern European uh, region. The reason why I underline that is because there is a sentiment that perhaps the next Secretary General ought to be from the Eastern European region. There is also a sentiment that the next Secretary General should be a woman. Do you think that's S more important? You know, I think both are important, but they cannot be the only factors. You also have to fact uh, factor in trajectories, attitudes, skill sets, um, and each of us brings a different combination of this. So I think actually it's going to be very difficult for the Security Council and the General Assembly to sort all of this out because there is no, I would say there's not one evident candidate. Because um, all of you are very high caliber very, group and that's, of and, uh, candidates. And honestly, I am so grateful to all the other 11 candidates who are willing to throw their hat in, who are willing to take this responsibility. It has famously been described by the very first Secretary General as being the most impossible job in the world. And so I'm actually very grateful that there are that many people who are willing to do it. With a job like this, what does a, you know, if a woman does indeed get the position, what does she bring to the table? Well, I have found over over the years that I have served uh, the UN that uh, women. Uh, together with fantastic men, so no, you know, nothing against them, but uh, we bring a, a different set of skills. Uh, perhaps because we are multitaskers from birth, um, we tend to deal with complexity without getting befuddled. Um, it's something that we're used to doing. We tend to be a little bit more patient, I think. Um, we tend to 
really take the time to listen and understand where people are coming from. And all of those are gross and perhaps irresponsible generalizations because there are fantastic men who also do it. Um, I think what is important about a female leading the United Nations is actually both symbolic, um, because we have had eight secretary generals there, all of whom have been men, but also there's a certain responsibility because it's not just about putting a woman at the head of the United Nations. It's about really opening up the space in so many other areas where we do not have gender parity yet. Now, you've been described by some newspapers as being a colourful diplomat. A some, colourful? A colourful diplomat. Oh, that's nice. Is that because of my two different colour eyes? <laughs> and we're not talking about what you wear, Christiana, <laughs> clearly. But in terms of that, you speak your mind. Do you think that the permanent five members of the UN Security Council really want a strong and opinionated Secretary General? Well, that's for them to decide, obviously, what, what they would like at this point in time. Uh, and it's not just the, the P5s, right? It's also the 10 elected members and then the member states uh, in, the, in the General Assembly. So it's, uh, you know, it's a collegiate decision there with different, uh, different categories of, of influence. Um, but, you know, I think one thing that I have actually been... Uh, very careful about is, yes, I have no doubt uh, and do not hesitate when I have to lead because there's no leadership, but I also am fully committed to collective wisdom. Uh, and I am very much of a team player. I really believe that decisions are better made when everybody expresses their opinion and comes to the table. Um, I wasn't born as a patient person. I was born very impatient. But I have learned over, over very difficult years that it is a good thing to be patient, particularly in the multilateral uh, process. You cannot take abrupt decisions that haven't been fully consulted. Do you believe the UN Secretary General, however, actually has any independence? I believe that that has to be carved out. Um, I believe that the Secretary General should not be independent from the Security Council and the General Assembly. I believe that the Secretary uh, General should not be dependent on the Security Council, uh, but I do believe that the Secretary General, the Security Council, and the broader General Assembly need to be interdependent of each other, and they need to work with each other. Each of them have different tool sets, and they have different possibilities to move the agenda forward. And the best of the UN comes out when the three can work with each other from different perspectives, without surprising anyone, using the best tool sets that they have, but definitely in a clear direction of travel that has been agreed to by everyone. Now, you've committed yourself to a platform of reform, but the UN is an unwieldy, large, bureaucratic body, which, like anywhere, subject to, to internal politics. Do you think it's actually capable of being reformed? Absolutely. Um, and the fact is that if you look at the history of the UN, you know, we all fall into the very uh, simplistic assumption that the UN has never reformed itself and has never improved itself. Well, that's wrong. Um, the fact is that uh, the UN um, has been, yes, a slow organization, but a very sure organization in continually living up to very, very new expectations. The expectations of the UN in 2016 have nothing to do with the expectations that that were put before it at its inception 70 years ago. So yes, it has moved forward, perhaps not as quickly as all of us would want, but it is a very large organization. But what would be your first priority if you got the job? You know, my first priority is to be a very, very serious student of all of the issues, in particular peace and security, that are fundamentally at the core of the responsibility of the United Nations. And where, frankly, that's not where my forte is, that's not my background. So I'm already studying night and day. That's a very female thing, though, to do, is to admit your weaknesses, isn't it? I mean... But I think that's a strength that we women have, OK? Because I think that if you are very 
open about the fact of here is my learning curve and here is what I am doing. I'm actually very proud of the fact that I'm a very, very quick student. I'm very proud of the fact that I am committed to all three pillars of the United Nations and to treating them equally. And I will only be able to treat them equally if I understand them equally. So you think peace and security would be number one in terms of... For me, yes, it would be number one. And it is also, by the way, 70% of the budget of the UN. Uh, and frankly, with the kinds of, uh, of conflicts that we have uh, now uh, erupting and also old conflicts, we have 16 peacekeeping missions. We have growing terrorism that keeps on changing here in Nice. You know, just an absolutely terrible attack that really lowers the bar of, uh, of entry because now just by hiring a big truck, now you can be a terrorist. You don't even have to have any skill sets. I mean, it is absolutely an untenable situation and one that the UN needs to, to uh, bring all the capacity that we have around the world to deal with it. Christiana Figueres, I'm terribly sorry to say we've run out of time. Thank you so Such much. Such things happen everywhere. Thank you very much, <laughs> Annette. Thank you for the opportunity. And that's it for this France 24 interview. Do stay with us here on France 24.